Our lecture today is going to be about color, one of the most important of the formal elements. And it isn't just artists that have to deal with color. It plays an important role in our daily lives, thinking about the color of clothing we want to wear, or our nail polish, the home or the room that we're going to be painting, or even the vehicle that we buy. Color is among the most important decisions we have to make. For an artist, it's even more important because color is the first thing we notice when we look at a work of art. We notice it before line, before space, even before pattern and texture. Color is important because it creates the mood of an artwork. It also helps us in creating space in terms of atmospheric perspective. It draws our attention. It conveys ideas through symbolism. But where does color come from? And the answer is, color comes from light, which is a pretty odd statement to make, considering light, for the most of us, is going to be colorless. But in 1666, Sir Isaac Newton refracts light through a prism, and we find out it's made up of an array of colors. Even Pink Floyd knew about this. Those six colors are going to be referred to as hues. So when light is refracted through a prism, it's broken down into a spectrum of six colors. Those colors are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. They always emerge in this order. However, you don't ever have to memorize them in this particular order. And later in the lecture, I'll show you a different way of memorizing them to make it easier. It's from these six hues, all other colors are created. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we can do is we can alter a hue by means of tints and shades. So if we have the hue of red, for instance, we can create a tint by adding white at various amounts to the red. We'll get colors like pink, salmon, and coral. If we decide to add black to red at varying amounts, we can come up with colors such as maroon, crimson, and scarlet. And we can create an image like this. It's still monochromatic, but we have a hue, we have black and white, and we can still create something very representational. Another way we can create colors is by mixing two or more hues together. Now there's two processes for this. One is the additive process, and we don't deal with that very much because it deals with light. In fact, this slide will give you a little bit better presentation of that. Imagine light projectors displaying colored images. The additive process is something you would use if you worked in a theater, if you worked for Disney, or if you worked at one of those fancy hotels in Las Vegas where they have the light shows. But for the average everyday artist dealing with paint and pigment, we're not dealing with the additive process. We're using the opposite project process of subtraction. So the subtractive process deals specifically with paint and pigment. And you can see in this diagram here that every time we start mixing colors together, the result becomes darker and duller than either of the parents. We do have to be careful because we can overmix paint and create really dark images such as this. We need to know how colors interact with one another. And the best way to do so is through a color wheel. And color wheels have been around since the 1700s. The Munsell wheel is very popular, as is this one. This one's not even a wheel. And this is the one that I like to use. This is a 12-step color wheel, just like a recovery process. And you can see not only the colors, but the names of colors, and also some numbers inside the wheel. And we're going to go over what those stand for. So with our 12-step 
or what's called the conventional color wheel. Number one stands for the primary colors. Number two, the secondary colors. And number three, what's called the intermediate or tertiary colors. And I'll explain what those are. The primary colors, again designated by the number one on the color wheel, are red, yellow, and blue. These are the primary colors. It's from these that no other colors can be created and no other colors mixed together can create these three. So here's a little visual image of them. So these are the top of the color wheel, the top of the food chart for colors. The secondary colors are violet, green, and orange. They're created when two primary colors are mixed together. So here again is a little visual image of those colors and how they fit together in the color wheel. So when we mix blue and yellow together, we create the color green. Yellow and red creates the color orange, and blue and red creates the color violet. These are the six hues. So the primary and secondary colors create the six hues, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And so for most people, that's the easiest way to remember the six hues. And then we have the tertiary colors. They're gonna fill out the color wheel. We don't need to memorize them, at least for my course. They're easily identified by the hyphen in their name. You'll notice that the primary colors are listed first on the left, followed by the secondary color at the right. And that's how our color wheels are made up. So when we look in the bottom left-hand corner for the red, and then we look in the bottom right-hand corner for the blue, you can imagine one plus one equals two. That's what's going to create violet. When we add another batch of red to the violet, one plus two is three, we get the red violet. So we can do it from a very mathematical situation or we can do it very visually. But the color wheel is something you need to know, and now you know how it's created. We also need to know how it's torn apart because artists utilize what are called color schemes, and there's three of them we're gonna be covering, analogous, complementary, and triadic. An analogous color scheme are colors that are near each other on the color wheel. And we generally break the color wheel in half for this. We have warm colors on one side, cool colors on the other. When we think of warm colors, we think of colors such as yellow or red. And this image absolutely is a very warm sensation when we look at it. It also relates to the topic of atmospheric perspective, where we have a very clear foreground and the background, especially the contours of the structures, in this case the mountains, are very hazy and they take on the same color that the atmosphere has. The atmosphere isn't even blue for the sky. It's kind of a yellowish tinge. So this is an image that relates some very warm feelings. The other side of the color wheel is the cool colors. And here we have the colors like blue for the ocean or green for grass. And this image contains quite a lot of cool colors. And whereas the last image I showed you, we kind of wanted to get out of that desert location. Here, we want to hang out with these people a little bit more. It looks like a cool evening and we're just hanging out and we're not in so much of a hurry to leave. Then we're going to go to complementary colors. Complementary colors are nearly opposite one another on the color wheel. Normally we take a warm color and a cool color. They can be opposite, such as green and red, but they don't have to be. They can easily be blue and yellow. Van Gogh was someone who 
consistently use complementary colors into his work. Because what they do when you have a cool color, which our eye sees as kind of retreating back into the distance, and a warm color, which our eye sees it as advancing toward us, that kind of juxtaposition, that vibration between the two colors upsets our optic nerve and we kind of get a little bit more tense and uneasy when we look at a painting like this that utilizes that complementary color scheme. In a letter to his brother, he states, I have tried to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. The room is blood red and dark yellow with a green billiard table in the middle. Four lemon yellow lamps with a glow of orange and red. Everywhere there is clash and contrast. So Vincent knows exactly what he's doing using these complementary colors and he knows he's affecting you mentally when you look at his artwork. And even here, even though the subject matter is also unsettling, that very heavy red background literally pushes these figures into our space because it's so overpowering compared to the cooler colors that are used here. Our last color scheme is a triadic color scheme. And here we're taking three colors spaced evenly around the color wheel. And there's usually two that are commonly used by artists. The most common of those two are the primary colors, blue, red, and yellow, which you can see here in this image, set up by the solid equilateral triangle. The inverted dashed triangle highlights the secondary colors. So in our work of uh, Mondrian here, the composition of red, blue, and yellow, we not only have the three primary colors, but we also have a triadic color scheme. When we talked about the complementary colors and how they made us tense and upset, here, these colors used together make us relaxed, happy. These colors work harmoniously together. And artists utilize this as well to affect us, whether it's Vermeer with the girl with the pearl earring, whether it's advertising, propaganda, and even our superheroes are all maintaining this triadic color scheme. Now we're gonna talk about three ways of representing color. The first one is local color, also referred to as objective color. We have perceptual color, sometimes called optical color. And then we have arbitrary color, and this is sometimes called subjective color. Now for my class, we're utilizing the terms on the left-hand side, local, perceptual, and arbitrary, because those are the terms that artists use most often. And we'll begin with local color. This is the color we know an object to be without having to see it. So if we were gonna paint a painting with bananas in it, they're gonna be yellow. The same thing can be said for fire engines, they're red. Sky is blue, the grass is green. These are colors we know the object to be without having to double check. And throughout most of art history, this is our goal, at least until the 1860s. But the artist here is trying to replicate the world as it is. In Edward Hopper's painting here, he utilizes local color, a blue sky, white clouds, and a green hillside filled with plants and shrubbery. Whether it's a real image like Edward Hopper's lighthouses or it's a romantic image like Bierstadt's Rocky Mountains, this is still local color. With perceptual color, this is the color our eyes perceive an object to be at a particular moment in time. And I know that sounds kind of deep, but I'll explain it a little bit further by saying that we've learned that color is derived from light. And the idea is that if light changes throughout the day, color has to change as well. And so the best example I could give you would be if we were in a very bright classroom and all of a sudden I turn the lights off. 
Well, the color of all of the objects in the classroom is going to change because I've altered the light in that classroom. The same thing as if we went to work first thing in the morning and we turned on all the lights. All of a sudden, the color of the objects, whether they're desks or computer screens, are going to change. So since color is derived from light, light changes throughout the day, these people are arguing color must change, therefore. Claude Monet and the Impressionists, they're the first people who really focus in on perceptual color. Monet paints this grain stack not once, but literally 31 times in order to capture this idea of perceptual color. So these grain stacks are painted during different times of day, different seasons, different atmospheric conditions, and you'll see that each of these paintings is different. Instead of thinking about him painting a grain stack, think about it as Monet is painting light's effect on the grain stack. And again, this is something that happens in the 1860s and 1870s when the Impressionist movement is underway. Monet paints not only grain stacks, but the front of cathedrals, and you'll also see paintings that he does with the Parliament. An important term to note here is on plein air, which just means in the open air. It's a French term. And the idea is that artists for the first time, again in the 1860s and 1870s, are taking their easels and paints outside of the studio and they're painting in front of the object, that's how you can capture perceptual color. You can't do it in a studio. You have to paint out in front of the object. While we think of painting outside as commonplace today, back in the late 1800s, it was innovative and revolutionary. And this is an example of a person painting on plein air. Our last type of color is arbitrary color. Here, the artist is going to decide what color to paint an object. And this could be done for emotive reasons or design reasons or just because it's the artist's favorite color or he wants to have fun. The sun, in this case, doesn't have to be yellow. It can be turquoise or blue. The clouds can be crimson. The sky could be green. The grass could be violet. And here we have all sorts of great color that can be used. For instance, these horses are blue. Yet in this later painting, they're gold. And even this tiger and its landscape are in the total use of arbitrary colors. And another famous work. Arbitrary color is something we see, again, kind of in the late 1800s and especially in the early 1900s with the movement of Fauvism. The one bad thing about arbitrary color is we don't know sometimes exactly if it's being used or not. On an exam, I will tell you, is this arbitrary color when I'm showing you a purple horse? Something that is absolutely identifiable as being arbitrary. In this painting here, Harmony in Red, we don't know really what the arbitrary color is unless we know a little bit of the backstory. For instance, the design on the wall and the design for the tablecloth are red. But in reality, Matisse's model for this design is a white cloth with a blue design to it. So the red in Harmony and Red is arbitrary. In fact, this painting was originally called Harmony and Green because the background and tablecloth were green. Matisse didn't like it. He repainted it to Harmony and Blue. He still didn't like it. He had actually sold the painting at this time, asked for it back from the person he sold it to, and repainted it Harmony and Red. But this fabric is something that was near and dear to Matisse. He saw it in a window of a secondhand store when he was riding near, riding by on a bus in Paris. He tells the story where he got off the bus, went in and bought this piece of cloth. He carried it with him his entire life 
and it's still at the Matisse Museum today in France. We see how important it is to him because this is a portrait of his son. It's called Portrait of Pierre Matisse. But one more foot, and poor Pierre isn't even in this photo. It's very much focused on the tablecloth, on this cloth that Matisse absolutely loved. And we see it in so many of his paintings. I want to cover pointillism, which is a completely different way of painting. Normally, if we wanted to paint, for instance, the color green, we would mix blue and yellow together to create that color. But in pointillism, we're mixing in, uh, instead of mixing, we're putting a dot of blue next to a dot of yellow. And our eye is going to mix those colors together for us optically. It's a very unique process and one that you can imagine is painstakingly slow. It's more of an experiment in color theory that George Seurat was interested in. It also took place in the late 1800s. This was a very experimental time with art because the modern art movement had just gotten underway. Because these paintings take so long to do, and because we don't really need to do them more than once to prove our theory about color, not too many pointless paintings were ever created. The one that you need to really know about is this one, Sunday on the Island of La Grande Jatte, the artist Georges Seurat. And this is a work done in 1884 to 1886. Nearly two years it took the artist to do this because it's made up of tiny points of color. There were 60 preparatory drawings used to create this work. And unfortunately, the artist had a very short life, died of a respiratory illness around the age of 31 to 33. And unfortunately, you know, he would have been so much more popular today, but we have this painting left over from him. And it's one of, I would say, the 10 most important paintings ever created. It was done through the technique of pointillism. And I'm also going to put down in the description block below uh, a link to uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off that showcases this painting. And the movie zooms in to the artwork so you can see the individual dots or points of color. This is also the only pointless painting I will show you over the entire semester. An artist that does work similar today, but not true pointillism, is Chuck Close. And with his work here, these are absolutely gigantic paintings, about nine feet high and six feet wide. They're lowered and raised by means of a hoist. Uh, the artist is handicapped. Uh, he is in a wheelchair. And what he does is he grids off small photographs and then transfers the value of the color into the different squares. And so it does have a very pointillist feel to it, but it's not true pointillism. It's just something that's kind of close. But that brings us to talking about value. And value is a measurement of how light or how dark an object is. Through changes in value, we're able to perceive form. So it's why if we're sneaking into the house in the middle of the night, we trip over furniture because it has the same value as the walkway. We're not able to see the change in color. It's also the same reason that we use black text on a white page is because it's easier to read. You need to know that the extremes of value are black and white, and our eye can discern over 40 value changes in any specific color. You're probably familiar with the value scale. It's 10 sections, and it's made up of various shades of gray which is what you get when you mix black and white together. But it's how we're able to see and perceive form. So in a photograph like this, or another one like this, which may be a little bit easier to see, 
we have the value scale next to it and we have this wonderful scene that's made up entirely of gray tones but we're still able to recognize the sky, rocks, shading, trees, the valley, snow, all with maybe about six or seven different value changes. When we have two colors together, we can talk about their value contrast. And the differences between values help us in various ways. For instance, it can create the illusion of space such as an atmospheric perspective, but it can also create a focal point or emphasis. So this is a painting that utilizes atmospheric perspective, a very clear and well-defined foreground, and as we move into the distance, the contours become less distinct, the mountains take on the form of the atmosphere. But when we look at the rock outcropping where this guy is standing, we can see that we have some very dark values, against some very white clouds. And that tremendous value contrast brings that closer to us. Where the mountains in the background, whether it's the clouds or the mountains or the sky itself, the value change between those three objects are very, very small. And so our eyes push that farther away. That's how atmospheric perspective is created by the artist. In this engraving here, we would normally look right at the center of the work. Think about a painting where we might have an image of the Last Supper and Christ is always in the center of that painting. That's where we are really focused on looking. But in this engraving, we have a very high value contrast off to the right and that immediately draws our attention to establish the focal point or emphasis. Another term going off of value is chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is the Italian words for light and dark placed together. When we talk about value itself, it's a measurement of how light or how dark an object is. But what chiaroscuro does is this is a technique where the artist manipulates value in order to give the illusion of three-dimensionality. My definition is, it is the gradual shift in light and dark values to imply depth and volume. It's also one, or, one of those wonderful techniques that was invented during the Middle Renaissance, during the 1400s, to make artwork look more realistic. This is our standard chiaroscuro sphere. And we can see on the sphere in the upper right-hand corner, we don't have hardly any value changes at all. And they move slightly darker the way we get away from that light post. The background is also filled with some shading and it makes this sphere look three-dimensional. If this sphere only had one value to it, it would be a flat circle. So this is a gradual shift in value to imply depth and volume. So here's an example here where there is no value changes, actually just one going from black to white. There is no gradualness about it. It's flat and two-dimensional. Here's another chiaroscuro sphere with the value scale below it. So we can see that gradual shift in value, again, to create a three-dimensional image. It's something that's used here in this drawing and in this photograph. So chiaroscuro is one of those really important techniques that we have of creating a three-dimensional space. And our final term is tenebrism. Tenebrism is defined as dramatic illumination. Whereas chiaroscuro is a gradual shift, tenebrism is a drastic shift. It's kind of like chiaroscuro on crack. It is that intense. It was popular for a short time during the 1600s, and it's still used throughout other ages of art after the 1600s, but not to the intensity it was during that century. During the Baroque era, which is art of the 1600s in Europe, 
we see that it has more of a theatricality to it, that it looks in this painting as if a, a spotlight is falling on a darkened stage. And with this painting particularly, it focuses in on the woman's face and also a little bit on the jewelry that she's tossed aside. A lot of paintings with tenebrism have that one single candle, and in this case, it's reflected in the mirror. They also tend to have very dark backgrounds and surroundings, so we can't really tell where the figure is or the depth of the room that the figure is placed in. And here we have another painting also done with tenebrism. And you can see, again, it's kind of like that spotlight falling on a stage. It immediately focuses in on where we should be looking. There's theatricality and emotion involved here. We have that single candle on the nightstand and it brings us very quickly into the scene. And this is where I'd like to stop my lecture on color.